Good afternoon. I'm Larry Diamond, Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. With Hoover Research Fellow Glenn Tifford, I lead the Hoover Institution project on China's global sharp power. We join with the Center on US-China Relations at Asia Society, our co-sponsor today, in warmly welcoming you to this event with the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, David R. Stilwell, who is joining us uh, from Tokyo today and will address the theme of today's session, Covert, Coercive, and Corrupt, Countering Chinese Communist Party Malign Influence in Free Societies. Following his address, he will engage in a conversation with two leading China scholars, Orville Schell and Oriana Mastro. But first, it's my pleasure to welcome for opening remarks, the director of the Hoover Institution and the 66th Secretary of State of the United States, Condoleezza Rice. I'm delighted to open this session um, of our project at Hoover on uh, Chinese sharp power. And I especially want to welcome Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian Affairs, uh, David Stilwell. This project, uh, I think, is one of the most important uh, that we're engaged in because we face uh, an extraordinary challenge with a rising China. Ever since Deng Xiaoping decided to bring China out of its isolation and uh, presidents like Nixon and Carter followed up to get us into a position where we were actually in diplomatic relations with China, where we had recognized the People's Republic of China, uh, where we had come eventually to a one China policy, uh, continuing our uh, obligations to Taiwan to help it defend itself, but really with an expectation that with this country of more than a billion people and uh, economic potential that was potentially unknown uh, in uh, the, the history of the international system, there was really a decision uh, that we had to integrate China. And that belief, that integrationist narrative, if you will, really dominated uh, American foreign policy for uh, four decades. Uh, there were expectations uh, that this China integrated into the international system would be a net contributor as my colleague Bob Selleck once called it, um, a responsible stakeholder. And indeed, there were some benefits to China's integration. Uh, of course, 500 million people were lifted out of poverty. And of course, China did contribute to international economic growth, first by being uh, the low cost provider of labor, but also being a place where people could manufacture, where they could assemble. And so China was a contributor to the international economy. There were also hopes, though, that over time, uh, China would be not just a responsible stakeholder, but a more liberal society. There were those who believed that China might go all the way to democracy, but even those who didn't see that as a possibility believed that the um, exposure to the international system, the exposure to the outside world would ultimately lead to governments in China that were more tolerant of their own people. That has not happened. And there was always a risk. There was always a risk that by having a, a closed society within an open international system, uh, that that closed society would eventually take advantage of the openness of that system. For so many years, that system had been dominated by democracies. Not every country within the international economy uh, as it emerged after World War II was a democracy, but the most powerful countries were the United States, Great Britain, the countries of Europe, Japan. And so there was uh, a harmony between the domestic politics and the domestic system and the checks and balances of democracy and the openness of the international system. For the first time, we have a very, very powerful state that has been admitted to that international economy, to that open system, and has remained and even become more authoritarian at home. And so the question before us is how to prevent this authoritarian regime 
from taking advantage of the benefits of openness and indeed taking advantage of those countries that are democratic and open themselves. We have to understand how China is coercing. We have to understand how China is influencing. And we have to understand how China is using the benefits of the international economy and the open system to increase its military power so that its more assertive role in places like the South China Sea and indeed uh, in its aggressive behavior toward Taiwan is actually using military power that has benefited from this connection to the open system. This isn't the Cold War. The Cold War was an ideological struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union, but the Soviet Union was a military giant, but a technological midget. China is a technological giant and well on its way to becoming a military giant as well. And so this is an incredible challenge. It is a challenge though too, to our values. To be true to those values while not allowing ourselves to be taken advantage of. We do not want a situation in which innocent people, just because they are of Asian descent, are somehow held in suspicion. Whether they are citizens or green card holders or visitors, we want to remain open to the world and to them. And they do not, we do not want them to feel intimidated in any way. We want our universities to be cognizant of what is going on in some of the programs that uh, have been sponsored by China. We want the universities to be cognizant of what is going on in our frontier technologies labs and AI and quantum computing. We want our universities to be cognizant that there are those who under the guise of a fellowship or a PhD program uh, might in fact be those who would go back and help the PLA to make Chinese, a Chinese military power even stronger. We want to be cognizant of that. But we also want to remain universities which are open. And we want to influence the next generation of Chinese students because one day we have to hope that that belief that integration into the international system, openness to the world, will indeed have an impact on China too. First, we need to understand what we're facing. We need to understand all of the ways that China carries out policies of coercion or influence or increasing its military capability at our expense using our knowledge. We need to understand the relationship between the Communist Party, the PLA, and research enterprises in China with whom we would then have relationships. We need to understand too our tools for dealing with it. And our tools are many. A free peoples, I believe free people will always triumph but free people have to be cognizant and they have to be aware of what is going on around them. Now I want to say one other word about a truth telling and that is this, that when we tell the truth, we are at our strongest. I'm a veteran of the old Cold War and the Soviet Union and the marvelous way in which at the end of the Cold War it was clear that our values had triumphed. I'm often asked about some of the tools that we used in that time. And one that always comes up because people are concerned about Chinese influence operations and uh, Chinese efforts to, to uh, cause uh, dissension in our systems. And I'm always asked, well, what about Radio for Europe and Voice of America? which obviously had a huge impact on the outcome of the Cold War. And I say the truth about Voice of America and Radio for Europe is that they told the truth. They told the truth to a population 
that knew that their government was not telling them the truth. And so we need to use whatever tools we can to let it be known what China is doing, to let it be known in Africa, to let it be known in Europe, to let it be known to the degree that we can in Asia and certainly to the degree that we can in China itself. Because ultimately that is our best tool, truth telling openness. Again, I am very excited about this project because I think it does give us a chance to understand what we face and to design strategies to deal with it. I want to thank Larry Diamond and his colleagues uh, in the China Sharp Power Project. Again, I want to welcome uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, Stilwell. And I want to say to all of you watching out there, uh, this is a battle we have to win, and we will. Thank you very much. It was great to be with you. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Secretary Rice, for those inspirational remarks. Now it's my honor to introduce the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, David R. Stilwell. Before joining the State Department in this increasingly pivotal role, Assistant Secretary Stilwell had a distinguished 35-year career in the United States Air Force, retiring in 2015 in the rank of Brigadier General as the Asia Advisor to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. During his Air Force career, he served multiple tours of duty in Japan and Korea as a linguist, a fighter pilot, and a commander and as defense attache at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing from 2011 to 2013. From 2017 to 2019, he served as director of the China Strategic Focus Group at the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command in Hawaii. In June 2019, he assumed the position of Assistant Secretary. In addition to his B.S. degree in history from the Air Force Academy, Assistant Secretary Stilwell also earned a master's degree in Asian studies and Chinese language from the University of Hawaii, and he was awarded in 2015 the Department of Defense Superior Service Award. Assistant Secretary Stilwell, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thank you for the, uh, the uh, introduction and for the opportunity here to exp uh, explain and elaborate on what all we're doing here at the State Department. Hey, greetings from Tokyo. Uh, being in the region is what I do. I'm happy to be here. Uh, and, and again, a good chance to work with uh, um, Stanford and Hoover and Asia Society. Heroes like Larry Diamond, Orville Schell. Uh, again, people I've uh, long looked up to and, and studied and, and, and read and benefited from. And uh, also, uh, it's great to uh, share a stage with uh, Secretary Condoleezza Rice. Uh, Again, it's a real honor to, to be here. I really appreciate her summary. It tees up what um, I'm going to present here uh, well, especially the part about truth taking, uh, truth telling. You know, one of my goals in this job has been messaging to tell our story better and to tell the truth. And it's ironic, but it's actually symptomatic that both uh, the Soviet Union and the Chinese uh, out, media outlets have the word truth in them, Pravda and Chilshire. Uh, and yet, uh, the opposite is generally true. And so the topic of uh, Chinese influence and, and uh, corrupt coercive and um, uh, covert activities uh, is uh, especially meaningful right now. And what you're seeing the administration doing, uh, as I talk about this, hopefully it will be, uh, it'll make sense, it'll be coherent. So um, the topic is that the, the fact that the Chinese Communist Party challenges our free and open uh, societies. And again, Secretary Rice made that point very clearly. Um, but the prosperity, liberty, and security of the American people and our friends around the world are at risk. And uh, it hinges on how we meet this challenge. To, pro, uh, to succeed, uh, effort is required not just by policymakers and national security professionals, but by all elements of society, as Secretary Rice anticipated, I would say. Uh, and not just uh, in America, but everywhere, which is again, uh, part of why we're trying to get the word out in these and other forums. 
Uh, a major worldwide defensive enterprise of this kind is difficult, uh, but it's a noble undertaking. The foundation is a common th uh, threat assessment that the Chinese Communist Party is uh, highly capable, it's ambitious, and it's also hostile to our basic political principles of democracy, openness, and individual dignity. It's important, first of all, that we recognize this challenge. I, I think we're there. The, the narrative has changed significantly in the, over the last year. Um, it is, uh, but it's also necessary that we give it the priority it deserves, despite uh, many other pressing matters that inevitably demand our attention. So the Trump administration's 2017 national security strategy centered on the observation that we are in a geopolitical competition between free and repressive visions of world order. Secretary Pompeo says that China is the first challenge he thinks of, uh, thinks of every day uh, when he wakes up. The Chinese Communist Party strategy uh, implicates private as well as governmental targets around the world, which is why it is important for all institutions in our society, private and government, to understand uh, the strategy and adapt measures to manage the risk, to counter coercion and to protect free expression. The Hoover Institution has been exemplary in this area, uh, including through its 2018 report on China's influence uh, and American interests, promoting cognitive vigilance. So today I'm gonna to emphasize three points. Uh, first, influence and interference operations are fundamental, fundamental to how the Chinese Communist Party engages with the world. Uh, and that's with all of us. We might prefer to think of China as simply a trade partner uh, or the home of great civilization, but the CCP today has taken an adversarial stance toward its neighbors. Uh, not just today, it's been a long-term process. We're, we're recognizing it today. There are also, uh, this adversarial response uh, touches on its immediate neighbors, contiguous, but it, and all other uh, dem democratic and other societies like the US and the rest of the world. The goals are not a stability or live and let live respect for the sovereignty of other law-abiding nations. Nope, the strategy is aggressive and it's intrusive. It not only rejects our democratic political principles, but it sees them as a, a prime vulnerability that it can exploit. China's role in the world today cannot be understood without reference to the wide array of malign uh, activities that the CCP undertakes to influence our societies in ways that are covert, coercive, and corrupting. I, we borrowed that language from John Garneau uh, in Australia, who's been a leader and the Australian government have, have led very well in this, uh, in this endeavor. So, I want to give credit to the folks who coined that term. Second, the principle of reciprocity is vital to understanding this problem uh, and encountering it. Reciprocity is basic in international relations. You got to give to get. Um, you send your diplomats to my country and I'll send them to yours. Uh, I open my markets uh, and you open your uh, markets as well. Yet for decades, we and other countries made exceptions for China but we allowed the Chinese Communist Party to engage with our societies on a non-reciprocal basis and Beijing exploited the uh, imbalance. And now our insistence on reciprocity is a long overdue uh, defense. That was the second point. Third, uh, coordination among allies and partners is imperative. This problem is global. In many ways, we and others around the world are still only waking up to the, the mass, the scale of this problem. We benefit from sharing information and ideas. Beijing prefers to exploit its size against individual countries in a bilateral fashion. Uh, it is often only by uh, acting in concert that other countries can shift the calculus in favor of reciprocity, transparency, and freedom. Uh, and so we must uh, do so. The uh, bilateral uh, aspect is, is noteworthy in that the uh, narrative out of Beijing is often it's the US versus China. And we've been working very hard to shift that. It's not just us, uh, it's many other like-minded. The drumbeat, especially coming out of EU uh, lately is impressive. So a lot of this hinges on the whole concept of the United Front, United Front Work Department. Uh, the world is increasingly aware of how the CCP is using its foreign engagements to influence, interfere and coerce. Uh, the awareness is disturbing and even shocking for many people uh, because for decades, the US and other countries 
forged links with China based on the optimistic good faith expectation that shared prosperity and trust would result uh, from our diplomacy, our trade, and our investment. It worked so many times in the past. Um, but um, we've had media and academic and people to people exchanges also falling under that same assumption. But the sad and dangerous reality is that the CCP has chosen to weaponize these engagements uh, to its advantage, and it uses them as uh, channels for malign purposes. Again, uh, primarily for to maintain its uh, position and to advance its position, to accelerate its growth and, and uh, development. Beijing officials claim to seek, uh, quote, win-win exchanges. They claim uh, to practice non-interference in other countries' affairs. And this is an important point. Uh, the irony of uh, this, this insistence on non-interference uh, in the five principles of peaceful engagement uh, is interesting when you see the totality of this activity. Uh, and I think we should shine, to quote John Garneau, some sunlight on this. Um, in reality, the conduct uh, is systematically predatory and hegemonic. The CCP wants control, and it, at least it wants a veto uh, in public uh, discourse and political decisions uh, globally, world over. So this is what guides its foreign interference activities, uh, these activities that China calls United Front work, uh, and we better understand this political warfare. Xi Jinping calls the United Front uh, uh, a magic weapon of the Chinese Communist Party, and Mao Zedong saw it the same way. So how does it work? Uh, I'll give you a couple uh, visible examples that, again, once we are awake to the problem, become you know, unbelievably obvious. Uh, United Front interference in Australia has produced years of cascading uh, news headlines. An up and coming senator was forced to resign over improper ties to the uh, Chinese uh, Beijing linked donor. Numerous senior officials retired uh, into jobs with entities controlled by Beijing. Advertising boycotts were organized against Chinese language newspapers that won't uh, tow Beijing's line. An intelligence chief uh, warned of the catastrophic harm Aust Australia is subject to as a result of espionage, interference, sabotage and malicious insider activities. At the University of Queensland last year, students demonstrating for Hong Kong's democratic rights uh, were roughed up by classmates connected to a Beijing sponsored uh, students association. Uh, the PRC Consul General uh, praised the spontaneous patriotic behavior of the pro-Beijing uh, rallies. Uh, Australia's defense minister then uh, warned foreign diplomats not to suppress Australia's free speech. New Zealand has had similar experiences. After university campus skirmishes over Hong Kong, uh, local PRC diplomats praised the spontaneous patriotism of the anti-democracy brawlers. In response, New Zealand's prime minister asked officials to remind their Chinese counterparts that New Zealand will uphold and maintain our freedom of expression. And oftentimes this is the, a fairly simple solution is just stand up, recognize the problem and say something. Uh, and there'll be threats that come from that, but uh, we've seen those threats don't, are very rarely carried out. In 2017, New Zealand media revealed that a Chinese born member of the parliament uh, had lied about his background when applying for New Zealand citizenship, concealing that he had spent 15 years working for the Chinese military intelligence. The parliamentarian who had previously played a prominent role in bilateral relations with Beijing uh, lost his seat on the Foreign uh, Affairs, Defense and Trade Committees, uh, but remained in the parliament. Co-opting friends and neutralizing enemies are two sides of United Front coin. In Australia and in New Zealand, scholars critical of Beijing have faced burglaries and death threats. In suburbs from New South Wales to New Jersey, Chinese dissidents and uh, activists are uh, hounded by Chinese Communist Party agents. You've heard about Fox Hunt and other things. United Front targets not just, uh, just people, but also information, including private data about large numbers of public and private individuals. In the United States and across the world, we see syst uh, systematic theft on a huge scale of intellectual property and technology from universities, uh, businesses, medical labs, most recently. At the United Nations and in capitals around the world, uh, the CCP agents are behind bribery scandals. Beijing's overseas infrastructure projects often go hand in hand with bribes for local elites 
uh, and really harsh uh, financing terms hidden in secret contact, contracts with non-disclosure agreements. Aggressive United Front propaganda work then dishonestly portrays the arrangements as benevolent rather than rapacious. The CCP is increasing its propaganda on television and in newspapers worldwide, uh, while at the same time undermining uh, independent Chinese language media wherever it is found. Pop culture, arts, and sports are major battlegrounds too. American Southern National Basketball Association thrown into crisis over a single tweet about Hong Kong. Players, coaches, and owners known for strong opinions are cowed uh, into silence when the topic is China. Fans are booed from stadiums for holding signs that say uh, Google Uyghurs uh, or flying a Tibet flag. And it's amazing that we uh, haven't said more about this to date. We see the conspicuous absence of Hollywood movies willing to pick, depict China critically or to portray the heroism of young people of Hong Kong, the leaders of underground uh, Chinese Christian churches or Tibetans just trying to uh, preserve their culture. There's also an increasing number of Hollywood movies portraying Beijing in, as a benevolent global leader, even in areas such as space, where in fact, uh, Beijing uh, very uh, recklessly carried out a uh, anti-satellite missile test back in 2007, littering low Earth orbit with a lot of uh, space junk. So we see the bullying of corporations, Marriott, Mercedes-Benz and many more um, to parrot CCP talking points lest they face state-backed boycotts undermining and impacting their bottom line. Business executives are enticed to tow Beijing's line uh, lest long promised access to the Chinese market uh, be cut short, curtailed or not materialized. Meanwhile, we've got COVID-19 disinformation. We have PPD, PPE shakedowns uh, globally and wolf warrior diplomacy. All these things are especially recently telling examples of all the things I'm describing. So all these manifestations of United Front work, uh, they subvert interests and principles that we all cherish. Uh, they all reflect the intertwined dangers of this coercive, covert and corrupting influence. And so we describe this of late as an iceberg. And uh, what we see of this, what I call fuzzy panda activity is what's above the waterline, but there's so much below the waterline that we have either uh, ignored or just simply not recognized. And so again, my goal today uh, and all along has been just to point out facts, right? Seek truth through facts. Beijing's instruments for exerting uh, this influence uh, are enormous. In recent years, Xi Jinping has, been, uh, has added 40,000 cadre to the United Front Work Department making it four times the size of the State Department's Foreign Service Corps. And that doesn't even count the other parts of uh, the Beijing party state that play a role in shaping foreign opinion and foreign governments to Beijing's liking. These include the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, the Central Propaganda Department, the Ministry of State Security, the Ministry of Education, the International Liaison Department, uh, the Political Work Department, the Central Propaganda Bureau, and the People's Liberation Army. These entities in turn guide a plethora of official, quasi-official and uh, front organizations that operate around the world, often and through uh, diaspora communities. Some of these United Front organizations identify as Beijing backed, but most try to present themselves in, as independent grassroots type NGOs or cultural exchange for friendship associations. You'll hear that word a lot. When you hear United Front, you'll see the word friendship uh, chambers of Commerce, media outlets, or academic groups. Then there are Confucius Institutes at colleges and, and universities, and uh, more disturbing is Confucius classrooms at the K through 12 level. These are funded by Beijing and play by Beijing's role, uh, rules. They were um, launched in 2004 by no less than the head of the United Front Work Department, uh, Liu Yandong. In 2009, uh, Politburo Standing Committee member and uh, ideology czar uh, Li Chang uh, Chun called Confucius Institutes an important part of Chinese overseas propaganda setup. All told, we face a large and deliberately opaque amalgam of Chinese Communist Party officials, agents, and cutouts seeking advantage in our societies. And that advantage is readily had uh, because as the Secretary, uh, Secretary Rice said, that we, are, we pride ourselves in being open and easily accessible. And so think in terms of this iceberg above the waterline, 
official PRC diplomats conducting legitimate diplomatic activities, uh, for example. But below the waterline, there is a far lar larger and murkier mix of actions and entities whose ties to the Communist Party uh, have been long ignored, overlooked, or understudied. Uh, these include PRC diplomats conducting activities inconsistent with their diplomatic status, such as the espionage tied to the PRC consulate in Houston before we shuttered it this, this summer. PRC state media personnel masquerade as legitimate news reporters when their real business is propaganda and espionage. I ask you to show me a byline by any number, any one of these many, uh, um, you know, supposed reporters. Um, researchers sent by the PLA into our high-tech university labs, especially those uh, who illegally hide their military affiliation on their visa applications. The iceberg further includes Confucius Institutes, Confucius Classrooms, and the Chinese Students and Scholars Associations uh, that chill academic freedom and free speech in our schools and universities. Also, United Front organizations working to co-opt state and local governments, diaspora communities, and other targets. And don't forget China's state-owned enterprises, which aren't just uh, owned on paper by Beijing, but can be used by Beijing uh, as, uh, at, at Beijing's will as instruments in this battle uh, of policies and narratives. There are also PLA-owned uh, enterprises, of which there are many operating in this country and around the world. And even uh, private Chinese firms, which just last month received aggressive new guidance from Beijing to follow Communist Party diktats uh, and support United Front work. You saw the fifth plenary just wrapped up and it re-emphasized uh, these points. So this iceberg deserves a serious study and scrutiny. Across our society and across the world, we must better track, expose, and when necessary, counter these vectors of influence and interference. That is why the State Department has taken steps recently under the Foreign Missions Act to identify organizations operating in the United States under the control of the Communist Party uh, by designating them as foreign missions of the People's Republic of China. It's just a fact, it's not a judgment. They, they do work for the, uh, directly for the government, therefore they qualify. We have so far designated 15 state propaganda outlets and the Confucius Institute Center of the United States uh, and the National Association for China's Peaceful Reunification this week, a key United Front group. Similarly, the Pentagon this year, for the first time, identified dozens of companies operating in the United States that are owned by or affiliated with the People's Liberation Army. Meanwhile, the Justice Department is pursuing a wide range of law enforcement actions against covert, coercive, and corrupting activity. This includes alleged visas, uh, visa fraud by PLA researchers in US universities, economic espionage by uh, corporate executives, Ministry of State security agents, and others, drug trafficking, money laundering, and more. Just this week, the Department of Justice charged eight individuals with acting as illegal agents of Beijing to harass, stalk, and coerce US residents, forcing them to return to Beijing against their will. And so without greater transparency, reciprocity uh, and cost, Beijing will continue to exploit this openness of our societies and, and advance their interests at our expense. If we just want a level playing field, we'd like reciprocity and you treat us that way, uh, we're gonna have to take similar measures. So let's dwell for a moment on reciprocity. President Trump said reportedly or said repeatedly that reciprocity is his favorite word uh, and mine too. It is an especially useful concept when applied to China because reciprocity and the lack thereof captures so much about the troubled and imbalanced relations that countries all around the world have found themselves in with Beijing. And reciprocity doesn't fix everything. Uh, it doesn't have to, uh, and it doesn't have to guide our interactions in all cases, everywhere and always but it is a basic guide to fairness, prudence, and caution, attributes that the world generally discarded during years of reckless engagement with Beijing, 40 years of trying hard uh, without any uh, real uh, response. We allowed the Chinese Communist Party to access our society that never extended to us. Uh, diplomatic access, educational access, trade access, NGOs, uh, three, four years ago, no longer they have to be sponsored by the PRC. Uh, investment access, science and technology access, even data access. We thought it was worth it, you know, that it wouldn't cost as much. 
uh, that it would aid China's development and crucially facilitate Beijing's political transformation into a responsible and friendly regime. As you know, the response, the uh, uh, result of all this though uh, is quite different. So access to our societies, our economies and our technologies certainly helped China develop uh, but the Chinese Communist Party only doubled down on Leninism, mercantilism, and hostility to the West. Now we scramble uh, late, but uh, not too late, to protect our own societies from being uh, transformed by Beijing. And so reviving this idea of reciprocity, give to get, is a absolutely fundamental and principal step. So there's no reason why Beijing's diplomats should be able to enjoy open access to American society, while the folks that I uh, work with in Beijing uh, and those of us who've been there uh, are prevented from even the simplest of interaction with society, uh, travel, and, and, and many other typical normal diplomatic activities. Uh, visiting universities is not too impo impossible right now and uh, other uh, interaction just is very difficult. And even if they don't make us, if they don't stop us from interacting, the people that we talk to are then harassed. That's just not, uh, not fair. Uh, there's no reason why Beijing state media propagandists should be treated as independent journalists in our country, uh, while Beijing further restricts the few Americans remaining in China uh, and other independent foreign journalists left uh, there. There's no reason why Beijing state enterprises, military affiliated companies, and uh, their technology national champions should enjoy every privilege of the American economy while Beijing denies market access to a large share of American firms. And it certainly doesn't uh, boost, uh, it doesn't uh, host major enterprises that serve our military. So in these areas and more, we are taking policy, regulatory and law enforcement action across the US government uh, to correct years of non-reciprocity, imbalance and abuse. It works inside the US, but again, to be effective, it's going to have to be uh, global. It's going to have to, there's an international aspect that's really important. As Secretary Pompeo has said, we encourage every leader of every nation to start by doing what America has done. Just simply insist on fair, equal treatment and reciprocity. Insist on transparency, insist on uh, accountability from the CCP. Uh, among the propaganda narratives promoted by the United Front is the notion that any scrutiny of the Communist Party activities is somehow a hostile act against Beijing or against the Chinese people. Uh, we talk about the party, you hear that, uh, we don't allow them to conflate that with 1.4 billion people. Uh, is, uh, all sorts of businesses and organizations know well uh, how to do risk management, how to do due diligence, uh, and how did you uh, understand knowing your client? It's long past due that we start systematically applying similar approaches to our engagement with China and the Chinese Communist Party. Indeed, one reason why is that under Xi Jinping, it's just become effectively impossible to engage China without interacting with the party. Things have changed over the last se uh, seven years. We encourage countries to study your own icebergs, uh, take stock of your own uh, policy toolkits, Examples, do you have laws like our Foreign Mission Act uh, as our Foreign Agent uh, Registration Act? If not, do you need them? You know, since uh, 1991, we've assumed that uh, the threat has decreased. Well, we know now uh, that it's not, it, the threat is there. Uh, what about the a China initiative like that of our Justice Department? The sorts of uh, espionage, theft, corruption, visa fraud, coercion, and other abuses being uncovered by our law enforcement uh, investigations they exist wherever the Chinese Communist Party operates. It's not confined to the US. Australia, uh, seeing a few years ago that its laws and government structure were lacking in uh, certain key areas, passed a landmark series of bills on countering foreign influence. Australia helped teach the world how to organize against this threat and how to think and speak about it. As Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull said, we will not tolerate foreign influence activities that are covert, uh, coercive or corrupt, uh, that is the line that separate uh, that separate legitimate that separate legitimate influence from unacceptable interference. So let's learn from each other, and let's coordinate, not only to compare notes but uh, also to establish deterrence. Despite the magnitude of the challenge, we have massive leverage, especially as a group. 
Chinese Communist Party wants access to what other countries uh, have. Lucrative markets and capital, advanced technologies, world-class universities and laboratories, international prestige. We must uh, no longer give these away to Beijing easily in hopes that the CCP will respond to our goodwill and kind. Its record shows that it won't. Transparency, reciprocity, fairness, accountability, rule of law. The golden rule, right? Treat others as you'd like to be treated. These are necessary guides if we are to prevent the CCP from continuing to assault our societies from within. As we posture for this challenge, it is also important to underscore that our concern is not with the Chinese people, as I just said, uh, who we admire greatly, uh, but with the policies of the Chinese Communist Party. Precise language uh, and strategy are vital. The CCP tries to make itself synonymous with the Chinese people and civilization, but it certainly is not. It also tries to equate criticism of the party with criticism of the people. We must be clear in rejecting this and it's showing that our free and open societies value the very uh, ethnic, cultural and political diversity that the CCP seeks to crush. And just look at the facts, right? Seek truth through facts, look at how things are in this country, free world, and then look at how they are in, the, in China and the, the obvious, um, the differences are glaring. And so the stakes, uh, why is it essential that free nations of the world exercise vigilance over the growing iceberg? of worldwide CCP influence. Simply put, the Leninist Politburo that runs China wants to set the rules for the rest of the world. It has to. It needs, it, you know, the existence of free and open democratic societies is an inherent threat. So a future Pax Seneca uh, fully realized would be aggressive, it'd be contemptuous of human liberty and, and domineering. Instead of a rules-based international order, uh, peaceful resolution of disputes, respect for sovereignty of law-abiding nations, a CCP-oriented world would require obedience to an uh, unelected uh, clique in Beijing. Technological advances in surveillance and control uh, risk casting the entire world into an age of tyranny. Ask the booksellers of Hong Kong for proof. Ask Jimmy Lai. Ask His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Ask Ai Weiwei or Liu Xia, the widow of Liu Xiaobo. Ask the Uyghurs, ask the brave citizens of Taiwan, ask any neighboring state with China. The Chinese Communist Party poses a real risk to our basic way of life, to prosperity, security, and liberty. Our task is to recognize, uh, alert others, and then take necessary steps to defend our hard-earned freedoms. They must be defended. Thanks, and with that, I look forward to uh, conversation. Uh, I want to really issue a, a deep and heartfelt thanks to Assistant Secretary Stilwell. You mentioned the off-quoted uh, phrase from uh, Prime Minister Turnbull uh, and John Garneau, covert, coercive, <laughs> and corrupting. I would uh, offer another three C's to characterize your remarks. Uh, cogent, uh, comprehensive, and compelling. Uh, this is, I think, uh, the best 25-minute uh, characterization of where we're at and where we must go um, that I've heard. And thank you for mentioning, uh, Mr. Assistant Secretary, our Hoover Asia Society report on China's influence and American interests toward, um, uh, toward constructive vigilance. Uh, this was a report um, that we produced in collaboration with our next speaker, uh, Orville Schell, the author Ross, uh, director of the Center on US-China Relations at Asia Society, which is again, the co-sponsor of this event. Uh, he is the author of 10 books about China, including most recently, Wealth and Power, China's Long March to the 21st Century, uh, and he organized uh, with me the Asia Society Hoover Institution Working Group that produced that report. He'll make uh, some uh, observations, uh, perhaps uh, pose a question or two, and then we'll hear from uh, our uh, newest colleague at Stanford University specializing in China, Oriana Scholar Mastro. 
Uh, she recently joined Stanford as a center fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies, where her research focuses on Chinese military and security policy, Asia Pacific security issues, war termination and coercive diplomacy. Dr. Mastro is also a fellow at the American Enterprise Institutes uh, and serves in the United States Air Force Reserve for which uh, she works as a strategic planner at Indo-PACOM. So we're really doubling down on the US Air Force today, very proudly. Uh, Orville, we turn to you first. Well, thank you, Larry. And uh, <clears throat> thank you for your uh, very comprehensive speech, uh, Assistant Secretary Stilwell. Um, I really have, don't wanna uh, make lengthy remarks myself except to say, I, I do believe we are at something of a, of a transition moment when all, all of the assumptions and policies of the past do beg our reflection and reformulation. Uh, I think we, we, we are truly beginning to see China in a very different light, uh, partially because it has become stronger and more, and more influential. Let me ask you this. Um, You've just been on a rather epic trip that's uh, taken the Secretary of State to the Maldives, to India, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, Vietnam, and now uh, you yourself are in Tokyo. And I wonder, uh, you've limbed a pretty, uh, 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 you know, dark picture about what it is that we confront uh, from China, not just militarily, not just in terms of trade, but in terms of this, sort of this united front policy and influence seeking. How have you found these countries you've just visited in terms of the way they are reappraising their own uh, attitudes towards China? And what do you think that bears for this idea of the Quad, which started off as pretty much a, just an idea but now seems to be getting fleshed out with some more real uh, substance. Uh, so talk a little bit about your trip and, and how it's changed your views of what partners, allies, and friends, of how they're looking at uh, the People's Republic of China. So that's a great point. Uh, some shameless uh, advertising, uh, one of my favorite <laughs> books. Uh, I know it's one of the early ones, but I, it's, I still reference it. Uh, a lot of what in there is cogent uh, today. Um, so travel, uh, it's the best part of diplomacy, I think, is actually going to see people where they are. I uh, was in Japan three weeks ago during the Quad. And I got to witness uh, the, uh, the merging of a, an agreement on the issue, and not just the issue itself, not just admiring the problem, but the solution. Uh, and the, just the coming together, I mentioned this, this position out of Beijing that says, this is the U.S. hostile policy, and trying to make this bilateral, and and is, you know the Quad, the recent travel statements out of the, the stops we made that you described, uh, increasingly align, and you know this helps the message, and it helps Beijing understand that it needs to change course. It needs to simply comply with the system that exists. It uh, it's a functioning system. It's it's existed and functioned for seventy years quite well. Um, it, yes, it wants to change that system to accommodate its own Leninist perspective on the world. Um, but I do think that there is, through uh, multiple voices, through a chorus of voices, there is an opportunity here to just simply get the uh, CCP to uh, slow down and to, again, abide by the rules that it, over years that it convinced us it was going to do. That was the hard part, was acknowledging that what it was saying wasn't sure. it wasn't uh, quite right. Uh, it was deception. Uh, I'll, I'll address your question here specifically in one second though. But uh, again, I'll point out the, the, you know, one of the issues, one of the areas we've been focused on is media. Wolf, I mentioned Wolf Warrior, Warrior Diplomacy, MFA spokesman saying things. If you just take a hard look at anything they say, uh, it's just a model of disinformation. And I use the term, you know, interference and you, oppose that with the uh, theme that we keep hearing is non-interference in internal affairs. And then you look at the facts in Australia, again, uh, Turnbull and Garneau were the first to actually shine some sunlight on that. Just look at the, the, the reality of it. And there's always this 
you know, propaganda disinformation aspect to it that when if you just consider what is being said and think about it and use critical thought apply you know free thought which is things that we pride ourselves in the uh the disinformation becomes very uh visible uh as far as the trip uh it represents quite well that what we mean by the indo-pacific strategy in the past eap uh east asia pacific bureau never uh well i, I don't want to overstate it i don't want to offend anybody uh but the, the EAP responsibility uh, and the South Central Asia uh, responsibility and approaches didn't always align. Uh, and so I hired uh, my, my deputy, uh, Tul Keshap. He is a South Central Asia expert. Uh, and one of my goals and one of the things you should take out of this trip is that this trip uh, e exemplifies what we mean by the Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, it is a coherent whole. And uh, this is why we changed the name in 2017, um, Indo-PACOM uh, and all the rest. So um, they uh, are still of varying stridency. The, you, the narrative coming out of India, Sri Lanka, Maldives, Indonesia, and Vietnam uh, aren't all the same. The volume isn't all the same. And that's, that's you know, expected. And I think you can attribute that to sheer size and heft. Um, some like the US uh, and Australia uh, feel they can afford economically to, to stand up and be counted. We believe this gives spa space to countries like Indonesia and Vietnam, who with the July uh, change in the US South China Sea policy, acknowledging the 2016 tribunal uh, outcomes uh, and the debunking Chinese maritime claims, Indonesia and Vietnam and others have been able to now exert their uh, proper use of their economic zones and the rest. Uh, Sorry for the wandering uh, response. I'd be happy to, uh, you know, be cross-examined on that. Uh, I will note that it is 4.50 in the morning here. So well, we'll give us 15 seconds on the trend line that you discern, having been to all of these countries. Which, what direction are they heading? Well, I believe, uh, you know, given all that we just laid out, I think that trend is very positive. Um, I, don't, I don't expect them uh, to do everything we're <clears throat> They, um, they can in, in many cases, uh, but just simply being transparent about what, um, what is going on in their countries by simply examining what's going on in their countries. In fact, they were in the past, they were um, deterred from doing that. Just, just don't look there. The one thing that we have to address further, uh, and this is the idea of sunlight, is going after the corrupting aspects of this strategy. Uh, because if you buy off uh, the elites, uh, you know, and if the, the people don't have visibility on that, or if they're being told they can't comment on that, then this strategy by the United Front works. Uh, it depends entirely on, um, you know, co-opting uh, leadership. And so part of this, and the reason we focus on media so much is you know, in enabling, empowering media to, to research and investigate. <clears throat> Great. Uh, well, uh, I'd like to come now to Dr. Uh, Oriana uh, Schuyler Mastro, and uh, we welcome uh, your observations and questions for the Assistant Secretary. Good morning. Thank you, Larry. And, and I apologize to the viewers for my romantic lighting over here. I think Assistant Secretary Stilwell is uh, up a little bit earlier than I am. I am in Sydney, Australia, uh, and, and unfortunately, uh, in an apartment where natural light lights the whole place. So we don't have the sun yet, but hopefully you can still see me. Um, okay, uh, Assistant Secretary Stilwell, it's great to see you uh, and have you uh, here at Hoover. Um, I wanted to ask you a bit about how to decipher or differentiate between sort of legitimate, illegitimate activities. And in some cases, you didn't use these terms, but um, people often use inappropriate and appropriate. So given, obviously I'm here in my civilian capacity, but given my military background, I feel like I am much uh, more clear eyed about some of the threats that you have mentioned. And I'm very happy uh, that you have discussed them. Um, and I think in the university setting in particular, there can be a bit of a naivete about um, you know, what, what uh, the goals are of some of these engagement efforts. And so I really applaud the, um, desire to bring that truth and to bring that knowledge more broadly. Given that you're a China specialist, um, what I want to sort of ask you is to put on 
the China hack? Because one of my main concerns is how um, acceptable or open other countries are to this narrative that you're presenting. So sort of two specific questions. The first is this legitimate, illegitimate, appropriate, inappropriate. We say it's very clear from our perspective, but I wonder if for some of our viewers, it's less clear why Voice of America is okay. Um, and you know the insert to the Washington Post or something would not be okay, or the difference between Confucius Institutes and Alliance Francaise, for example. Now you mentioned you know there's a difference between covert activities. So I'm wondering if like a PLA scholar did put on their application, their visa application, that they were PLA, or then are we open to them coming? Because to a certain degree, people. Even I, when I go to China, I gain information and I want to bring it back to the betterment of my country, right? So where do we draw the line on some of these things? And my, I wonder, you know, how much if you put on your China hat, what would they say to everything you just said? And I can imagine some of the counters, things like, you know, the United States has tried regime change 74 times between 1947 and 1991. You know, isn't foreign military interference worse than some of these political interference? Isn't what they're doing just basically, you know, politics to a certain degree? So I'm wondering if you can just sort of specify a bit more on, of course, China's going to seek influence, but, you know, how are they going to seek influence? What would you want to see them do as they seek influence? And along those lines, you mentioned reciprocity. And as you know, there's no Chinese word for reciprocity, right? The Chinese word that they use is like mutual benefit. And so how do you think some of these different views about reciprocity might actually impact our ability to get them? You say to give is to get, that's different than to give the same thing and get the same thing. Should we, should we continue to scale it based on you know, what China can give us? And so I, I'll, I'll leave it there um, and, and I look forward to your thought. We've wrestled with those quite a bit. Um, exactly what, what's appro appropriate and what's not. And uh, I don't think I can give you a uh, yardstick for what that looks like. Uh, but I would say, again, going back to the idea of reciprocity, is that if you're going to do these things in my country, then I should be able to do those in yours, right? They will always say, I mean, when I confronted them about why, when I was a defense attache, I could not uh, call my counterpart. I could not call my counterpart directly while the Chinese defense attache in the U.S., had every phone number in DOD and set up meetings on a regular basis. I asked him, why is it that I can't do that? And his answer was a smug, because that's not our system. So your point is, is exactly right, is it is a bit of apples and oranges. You know, their system is different, their culture is different. But look, we interact with 190 something other countries on this planet uh, without this same, uh, you know, there, there are ways of coming to uh, agreements on these things uh, that gets us the uh, the balance in the relationship that we seek. I don't think anybody would argue right now that the relationship between China and the rest of the world is in balance. Um, you know, the diplomatic corps in Beijing, when I was there, all agreed it was very difficult to operate, and it was getting more and more difficult to operate there compared to what they were giving their Chinese counterparts uh, in, in their specific countries. Uh, so there's a couple of examples that we gave. You mentioned the military. Uh, this is an area where transparency and uh, greater interaction is increasingly necessary. Um, and yet the, what we're seeing here is the ability to actually communicate uh, with the Chinese government uh, is, is getting more difficult. Uh, and so well, it's not just nice to have. This uh, interaction, this recipro reciprocal access is incredibly and increasingly important to make sure that uh, trend, you know, the, the messages are crystal clear, that there are no uh, you know, misunderstandings and miscalculations uh, that they often talk about. So in the military space, they, they call the relationship the ballast and the rudder of the relationship. Uh, I, I really hope that they begin to act on that. And you know, instead of closing down, that they act more openly. There's many other aspects I could talk about, since, but since we're speaking in academia here, I'll also uh, note that. I think it's more difficult for uh, academics and for school, schools to insist on you know, reciprocity since you don't often go to China to talk to their students and scholars, although I know you do, but it's not so formal. 
then I would just simply look at what the example they set in the country is uh, and either ask them to uh, abide by those same rules in the US or insist on opening up access uh, there. I, there was a, a, a few folks came out to East West Center when I was living in Hawaii uh, who you know, in 2015 and 16 were noting the, the impressive and rapid clampdown on conversations inside China. And then you quickly saw that clampdown happening outside uh, where conversations were being uh, squashed because they might be uncomfortable, might be talking about the Dalai Lama uh, and other things that they don't like. Uh, on that, Oriana, I would just say, you know, be who you are. Universities, you insist on academic freedom and academic integrity, uh, you know, insist on it. Um, remember Cambridge Univ University Purse Cambridge University Press a couple of years ago took down 250 articles the CCP deemed inappropriate. And then they reversed that decision, which was very uh, encouraging. You know, you have to think about those things. That's mm -hmm. a, a long, uh, would you like to redirect or cross-examine? <laughs> no, no, sir, I'm good, thank you. But I do think there's a lot of work to be done to understand actually the details of these activities. And I think you're right that what they do in universities is different than versus the government, which is different in the media versus NGOs. And so, you know, we need to figure out how to prioritize what are the most dangerous activities and, and you know, and, and which ones we should address first, last, and, and how we should address them. Great. Uh, I'd like to uh, call on my uh, colleague in the China Global Sharp Power Project at the Hoover Institution, uh, who also, uh, Mr. Assistant Secretary, just co-edited uh, a very important study, Global Engagement, Rethinking Risk in the Research Enterprise, uh, which very much uh, uh, addresses the challenge you posed of uh, PLA uh, scientists, engineers, and so on at the so-called uh, Seven Sons of National Defense uh, universities, uh, not disclosing their ties and then coming here and uh, collaborating on research projects and being visiting scholars. So Dr. Glenn Tiffert, would you like to pose a question? Thank you very much, Larry, and thank you, Assistant Secretary Stilwell, for joining us today. I wanted to pull together a couple of threads that others have raised uh, and not talk specifically about the academic issue, but talk about security cooperation and broader alignments. We're starting to see greater coordination and alignment among democracies in the Indo-Pacific as they face the challenges posed by China's more assertive posture in the region. For instance, Secretaries Pompeo and Esper just concluded a productive round of two plus two meetings in India. That resulted in the Becca Agreement, and India just invited Australia to join its Malabar naval exercises later this year. The reinvigorated quad composed of Japan, India, Australia, and the U.S. is one of the most promising platforms for a collective multilateral response to China, but opinions differ on how far its constituent members are willing to take it. In light of the United States' national security and national defense strategies, could you articulate the vision that the United States has for what the Quad could accomplish and how you'd like to see it develop? Thank you. That's a, a great question. And since you mentioned national security strategy, uh, it, I, I'm a simple guy. You know, I was a heavy equipment operator in the Air Force for 35 years. And uh, I, I do know that getting too complex and complicated makes frequently just defeats whatever you're trying to accomplish. So let's just go in simple terms. The National Security Strategy, uh, H.R. McMaster, uh, wonderfully I can talk about that, there's a good story in there, uh, noted that this is a strategic competition. We've never actually said that before. You know, the first step in, in any problem uh, s solving is acknowledging that there is a problem. And so by noting strategic uh, competition, we then uh, give, uh, uh, latitude and voice to people in the country to actually stand up and compete. Uh, what you saw then from the PRC was a uh, very shrill, the sky is falling, you know, uh, the hostile American policy. And I just remind them whenever I can uh, that internally they refer to the US and others as the enemy. And they've always done that consistently. Uh, so I guess the first step in all of this is just acknowledging the problem and then making your words align with uh, the, the reality. Uh, euphemisms don't help. We need to speak clearly. 
Uh, and again, these are simple solutions to the larger problem. Um, relating the NSS, uh, National Sturgeon, and the competition aspect to the quad, again, uh, for a one-bit processor, uh, they are self-evident. Uh, I don't have to uh, restate how many times in my short interaction with India um, since I started the Pentagon in 2013 till now that you've seen a very confrontational um, relationship in, in an area uh, of a contiguous border. And then that relationship with Pakistan, Chinese Pakistan uh, cooperation also puts uh, India on notice. I would, I would note in the quad uh, that it, it is not uh, one, it's not directed by the US. It really is a four point um, consensus based and um, sort of naturally occurring outcome uh, of democracies who see the threat and want to stand up to that threat. Uh, and uh, again, in, in my past experience, uh, the US often, one, one person said when we show up at ASEAN or when we show up in Southeast Asia, we don't make problems better or worse, we just add energy to the issues. Um, I think uh, we've gotten better at maybe showing up and listening more uh, rather than just you know, showing up in the room with three other partners in the quad and dictating terms. And if you saw the opening statements for the quad in Tokyo um, three weeks ago, uh, you heard the same story from all four partners is that look, we wanna acknowledge the issue, the problem, and then we wanna protect our own interests. We wanna protect our own systems. We don't wanna have our systems uh, um, adapted or amended or, or just outright changed by uh, a uh, authoritarian government. So in short, what I'll tell you is the quad uh, is obviously uh, visible. It's being, it's increasingly productive, but it's um, uh, organic, it's naturally occurring. It's, it's just a obvious response to uh, a rapidly accelerating an aggressive uh, PRC strategy. Okay. <clears throat> well, uh, we have only about uh, 10 or so minutes left, uh, Mr. Assistant Secretary. I'd like to get to a couple of audience questions at least. Um, let me uh, begin uh, by taking off uh, on India. This was the first stop of uh, Secretary uh, Pompeo's five-day visit to Asia. I don't know if you were with him on that uh, leg, but um, we did sign a new basic uh, exchange and cooperation agreement with India. Uh, ties between India uh, and uh, the US uh, with concern about China seem to be uh, deepening. There was a question about that agreement. Uh, it's got some implications for air force to air force cooperation so you might have a thought about that is there anything more you want to say about that visit that agreement and that relationship uh as you know i was there uh it was in, uh, a great trip i uh, i had my own meetings with uh, china watchers in the in the india in delhi in new delhi um so I can't speak to the exact outcomes of the two plus two conversation, but the fact that we had that conversation and the fact that there were tangible outcomes output uh, to me uh, speaks volumes. Um, uh, and I think that's about all I can talk about. I can't talk about the details on information sharing. I will note though that um, as Oriana knows that uh, you, you know, you need systems that can talk to each other in this, in this age, even if you're doing something as simple as humanitarian uh, relief, disaster assistance, uh, in an information age, uh, informa uh, military cooperation is driven largely by information. And so the more we can um, move things like information agreements and all those, uh, the better off we'll be able to respond to these things. Great. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we've just finished uh, six sessions uh, focusing on Taiwan and the Indo-Pacific region. The lengthening shadow of uh, the Communist Chinese Party state and its oft-declared ambition in its words to reunify uh, Taiwan with the motherland. Uh, Taiwan, of course, and its friends have a very different view about that language 
uh, and that relationship uh, hangs like a dark shadow over all our conversations now. What can you say about uh, the challenge of preserving Taiwan's democracy and uh, its right to be a free society uh, in the wake of this um, seemingly accentuating resolve in Beijing to possibly uh, you know, uh, address this situation by means that are covert, coercive, and corrupting or just plain coercive. Uh, what assurances would you want to give to the people of Taiwan and its friends? And how do you see that challenge in the wake of uh, what uh, Beijing has done to the people of Hong Kong? Uh, we could probably talk for hours. That, that should be a topic uh, that you host for the next event. Uh, it's, a, it's a really important subject. Uh, I give a speech, um, by the way, most of the stuff I do almost all of it, uh, other than this free talking is done by others, smarter people than me. Uh, and so I always want to give credit to the, the Fife's and the Keshups and the others in this world. But uh, there's a speech uh, this time last year uh, on 40 years of trying, uh, 40 years of giving, you know, a little bit to the PRC uh, in order, in exchange for consideration on issues that we consider important. And the realization after 40 years that they never intended to give back. Uh, you saw this summer, uh, I gave a presentation uh, at another um, think tank on the six assurances that were recently de declassified. And, and the reason we're doing this uh, is to uh, go back to the original agreements from 1979, 1982, uh, where we did agree with the PRC that you know, we would recognize them or we have a one China policy and all those things, but that the question of Taiwan would be resolved peacefully without coercion or use or threat of use of force. And what we've seen over time, uh, and part of this, the, uh, the, there was another document declassified uh, August 17th, 1982, where the Reagan administration noted that, you know, although we want to trust the PRC, we should trust but verify famously. And that if, you know, arms numbers on the weapon sales would go down, but the opposite happened. Therefore, there was uh, an acknowledgement that we might have to continue arms sales uh, to make sure that the balance across the strait uh, gives Taiwan the ability to negotiate uh, without coercion or use of force. What has happened over the years, look at WHA recently, World Health Assembly, where Taiwan was able to participate freely through, through, through 2017 and it was uh, excluded and excluded again uh, this session, even though they've got lots and lots to offer. We are, the, our policy hasn't changed. We're just going to uh, insist on it, vice uh, allowing it to be whittled away and eroded. And uh, again, the, the, you'll hear the Beijing uh, gets very uncomfortable with this, but I, you know, I will just reassure that there is no intention to somehow uh, expand. We just want to get back to a place uh, where Taiwan can deal with uh, the mainland uh, from a position of, uh, um, so we can negotiate uh, the solution by having it dictated to them. Great. We've got just a few minutes left. I want to ask Orville Shell and Oriana Mastro if uh, they have any uh, brief additional questions. Maybe I'll give you each a minute and the final words will go to the Assistant Secretary. Orville? Uh, I'm curious to know uh, how you look back on the period of engagement. Was it a mistake? Were we deluded? Were we just uh, unapprised of, the, uh, of China's intentions or was it a, a smart move to try to shepherd China out of its revolutionary past? And then, you know, uh, what part of engagement should we still cling to even in this period of adversity? So that is the, that is the question. And that speech last week, last year, 40 years of trying, and no, nowhere in there do you hear me criticize the last 40 years. We had to try, right? And it, it worked in the past, and we've seen peaceful transitions. I mean, look at the Republic of Korea. Uh, this activity, this sort of engagement brought Korea out of, uh, you know, when I was there in 1980, 
a dictatorship uh, and it moved it into a strong, vibrant democracy. So you had to try, um, but there is a point where you have to acknowledge, and I came to this conclusion in 2011 when I showed up in Beijing that it's not going the right way. Um, I, I, we should pat our, we should be very proud of the patience we've demonstrated, uh, but we should also be insistent on uh, making sure that China lives up to its many uh, uh, agreements. And it's not doing that. And so we have to go uh, a more firm stance. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. We, we definitely, uh, we had to try and we're just gonna take a, a more firm line now. Oriana. Yes, thank you. So now, sir, we're in a great power competition with China, and uh, I'm very happy to see that kind of formulation. As you know, China has been competing with us since its founding, so it's, it's good that we've kind of woken up to that. Uh, I won't ask you what victory looks like, because I think this is a long-term, potentially sort of perpetuating state. So I'll ask instead, what does winning look like? You know, how do we know that we are out competing in China or you know, that we're doing well? And what are some of the sectors, areas, or indicators that, that you're looking to um, that for you are the most important that you'll be the most proud of uh, if, if we actually reach certain goals? Wow, it's like, it's like it was planned. That's my getting off stage. This will be my, my uh, closing points. That's fantastic. What does victory look like? Um, I would send you, I would refer you to the secretary's uh, speech at the Nixon Library. I think uh, that uh, gets to uh, much of the, the point and uh, he said it far better than I did. Uh, I will point to the secretary's um, very vigorous approach to speaking out. Uh, that's victory. The fact that people, uh, not just the US anymore and it's not just Secretary Pompeo or the president, people globally are, uh, Speaking out, the Czechs, the Czech uh, Chechia trip to Taiwan, 90 member delegation without fear uh, of the reprisals that come from that, that's victory. The Germans inviting Taiwan to the Bundestag is uh, another victory. The WTO, w, uh, sorry, the World Bank taking a harder look at Chinese uh, state-owned enterprises uh, and whether or not they should be included in contracts. The China Communication Construction Company and others that we recently designated as SOEs. Uh, all these things are victory. Call me uh, Pollyanna, uh, say I'm overly optimistic or maybe I'm too close to this subject because you know we're right here. But my assessment is that victory, uh, well, we are on the way to an accommodation, some sort of a balance between a free and open democratic world and a system uh, in the PRC uh, that, that doesn't appreciate that, but the longer these two uh, systems are in competition, the more obvious the right answer will be. Uh, the same answer we came to in 1991. Hopeful that, like we mentioned before, that four years of engagement might actually help this system morph into something that's you know less confrontational, something that appreciates fair trade and free access and 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 real competition. Uh, I think we can get there. Uh, I'm hopeful that we can. And then I'll point to this uh, forum uh, where it's not just Dave Stilwell, EAP, Secretary Pompeo, it's many, many US and global organizations that are finally uh, joining in chorus to tell the PRC that they need to adapt and change uh, and, and accommodate our real interests and concerns. And we're well on our way, but I give credit uh, again to Stanford Hoover, and to all of you for doing that. Um, for being strong partners in all of this. So again, thank you for the opportunity. Um, look forward to working with you uh, even more. Great, well, uh, I thank you, Assistant Secretary uh, Stilwell, uh, once again for these uh, cogent uh, uh, and compelling remarks. Uh, we're just a few days away from the most sacred, uh, sacred exercise in uh, any democracy, which is a national election. Uh, and whether uh, we have uh, another second uh, Trump administration or uh, a return uh, and rotation of power, uh, either way, I hope that the uh, important innovations uh, and 
uh, really, I think, historic steps toward a U.S.-China relationship uh, based on principles of uh, cognizance, as you said, uh, constructive vigilance uh, and reciprocity uh, will uh, endure as guiding principles in American foreign policy. I'd like to thank you for your remarks today. Uh, thank Secretary Pompeo for lending you to us for this hour and 15 minutes. Uh, thank our audience and C-SPAN for joining us. Uh, uh, thank Orville Schell and uh, Oriana Mastro for their remarks. Uh, thank um, the uh, Center for US-China Relations at Asia Society and our staff at the Hoover Institution uh, and wish you all a good weekend and Assistant Secretary Stilwell a safe return to the United States. Thank you all so much. Mm -hmm.